What's up, everybody? This is Greg with Delta, and this is the Be The Difference podcast. This podcast is all about making you better in your life and in your business with coaching on sales, leadership, mindset, marketing, everything under the sun when it comes to being an entrepreneur, and we bring on guest speakers. Today, I've got the honor and pleasure of welcoming Mr. Julian Chapman. Julian, it's a pleasure having you, sir. Greg, it's terrific to be here. Thanks for having me on. Oh, you're welcome. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. For those of you that don't know Julian, Julian has over three decades of experience engaging teams and organizations from small groups to thousands of employees building their leadership capability. His leadership knowledge is augmented by his 30 plus year second career as a member of the Canadian Armed Forces from which he retired in 2014 at the rank of Brigadier General. He joined Forrest and Company in 2002, taking over as president of the company in 2015. Known as a pioneer of thinking in the workplace, Julian helps teams solve problems through effective thinking. His thoughts on leadership, organizational development, and accountability have been published in HR Reporter Magazine, CPA Bottom Line Newspaper, and HR Professional Magazine. He holds a BA from the University of Toronto. He's a graduate of the Canadian Army Command and Staff College, the Canadian Forces College, and an alumnus of the U.S. Army War College, my favorite. He lives in Toronto and is married to Wendy, with whom he has four children. Julian. This is going to be awesome. I love talking about leadership. Well, Greg, thanks. That's quite a uh, quite a long bio, but uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it is a, it's a topic that comes up all the time, right? Everybody talks about this thing, leadership, but uh, but what's it all about, right? Exactly. What's it really all about? So yeah, so it's uh, it's a piece that I've been struggling with for a long time. Mm-hmm. You know, back to uh, you know, you've got a military background as well, so yep. you understand the nature of it that. We talk about leadership training in the military, but it becomes leadership experience and management training. So mm-hmm. how do you operate the systems? How do you manage, you know, get the troops to the right place at the right time? All that sort of thing. But then the leadership stuff just becomes an experiential thing. So it's a good uh, way to put it. That's a really good way to 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 explain how it's actually laid out, which is very accurate. Well, and, and and so I talk about the nature of managerial leadership as as a critical thing for people to understand that you actually have both have to have both sides. Mm-hmm. I mean, the one most common role in all organizations doesn't matter whether it's uh, for profit, not for profit, you name it. The most common role is managerial leadership. Right? We've all got expertise. You know, we're finance, we're salespeople, we're HR people or operations people, but the common role is managerial leadership. And that's bringing management and leadership together. Mm. You actually have to have both to be truly effective. Yeah. You can't just be a great leader because you won't get anything done, right? You won't have everything organized. And you can't just be a great manager because then you're going to be a taskmaster and nobody's going to want to work for you. So you yeah. got to bring those two things together and make them actually work. So I talk extensively about managerial leadership as distinct from just leadership in general, because everybody uses the term leadership or leader, but what do they really mean by that? So, uh, so I try to be succinct in that. I, I see them as a, as an art and a science as leadership, as the art managerial as a science. Cause it manag- the managerial piece is very fact driven. It's very, uh, data driven, right? Um, and, and it's a, it's very much of a science, whereas leadership is very much of an art. It's, it is influence. It is learning how to communicate appropriately. And there's no right way. There is no 100% solution. Just do this. It, it, there's so many different tools you can use in different scenarios. And some people can wield them better than others. And some, it just depends as, as we used to say in the military, it's TC dependent mission, enemy troops, train time, kind of like, yeah. it just depends. <laughs> it just depends. Uh, that's, it's very true. And, uh, you know, there are a couple of things that, uh, that you said that sort of bring to mind. At the beginning, you talked about my bio about thinking and understanding the nature of the tension between tangible thought and intangible thought. So, you know, thinking from the head and thinking from the heart. And that management thing is is about thinking from the head. It's about how do I organize these things? What are the th- chains of events that have to occur? How do I how do I practice continuous improvement on this? All of these sorts of things. Whereas the leadership side is the very soft internal intangible side of making that connection and having a feeling and using my intuition and sensing what's going on. And, and you have to be able to do all those things. And, and the other thing that you brought to mind is, is that uh, 
I like to say that you've got to recognize that you can't be perfect. Mm. We live in an age of perfectionism. Everybody wants to be perfect. You got to have that perfectly sculpted body, that perfect job, that perfect family. Hence why would we have social media, right? Yes. So, so the point is, is perfectionism is the sure route to unhappiness because you're never going to quite get there. Mm. I've made all the mistakes in the book, I think. At any rate, I'm sure there's a lot more. But, uh, but with every mistake is a seat of is a seat of of learning and success. Exactly, exactly. So you just have to learn from them, and it's it only becomes an issue if you make the same mistakes over and over and over again. Yeah. But as long as you're learning from them, and you can't be perfect. Far too many times we see this in people. They don't want to engage in this managerial leadership because they don't have it perfect. I don't have the secret decoder ring or whatever, you know, the secret ninja handshake to be able to do this sort of thing. You just have to get yourself into it. And back to your point, leadership, the people part is not the science, it's the art. And you've got to, you've got to engage your whole self in that. So, so it's a, it's a very real issue. It is. It is. And I mean, when you look at, I mean, I love the concept of managerial leadership that you're talking about right now, because you're absolutely right. It's, it's, um, I see it. I, I like to liken leadership to sales because a lot of the strategies and tactics that you use in sales, if you're selling appropriately, you can, the same things are done in leadership. Leadership, all you're doing is you're selling an idea. You're selling people on an idea to follow you, to lead. Now you also have to lead yourself effectively, right? And they have to have belief and faith that you can do the, do the job as well and the job that you are doing the job. But in order to influence people, there's a certain amount of, there's a certain amount of sales capability that's kind of there. It's inherent, right? So when you look at sales and you break down sales, there's an art and a science to sales too. Too often people focus just on the science of like, here's all the facts of the widget that I'm selling. Here's what it can do. Here's, and it's all the facts, the cost, the breakdown, the data, the numbers, and they don't talk about the emotion of like, this is what the product is going to do for you. Where do you want to go? Like, where are you at? Where do you want to go? And using that product or service as the bridge between the two of them and really tapping into the emotion, which is the art of it because there's all kinds of ways that you can do that like i i like i prefer the socratic method i prefer just asking questions and having them tell me where they want to go and then them getting to the point where they're like how do i get there <laughs> like how, how do i fix this how do i change this oh perfect let me go and show you <laughs> you know because it's it's a very simple method and it works very well for me you know and it's and for me what i've seen in, in, in my sales training is that it's duplicatable right, right. So most, most people can do it but it's there's still an art to it and like how you ask the questions your tone of voice you know your tonality your pacing um mirroring verbally stuff like that that you can do or you don't have to do it just depends but that's kind of the art and then the science is like the is everything that has to do with the neocortex it's all the data, the facts, the figures, all that, that back up the decision that they make for the sale, which is all the why, which comes from their limbic brain. That's very much the same as what you're talking about when it comes to this managerial leadership. It's like this two halves of the same coin. You can't, you can't just have one, right? Well, if you want to be the most effective. Well, it's it's interesting you say that, and 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 the, the way you described it, that's uh, you know that's exactly how we approach the nature of selling, particularly from the standpoint of thinking, because everyone, regardless of if you're in a sales position, no matter what you're doing, is you're selling all the time. Mm -hmm. But sell is a four letter word that starts with S, right? People are scared of it; they don't they react to it. But we define selling as getting people to want what they need. And so to your point around the data and the details is to convince them, is to provide them with that what I've got for you is what you need. Mm -hmm. But then I also have to raise that desire in you to actually want it. And so that that's where that connection to the, the in the non-data point, in the in the what we refer to as soft thinking, has mm -hmm. to occur, that I actually have to raise that desire. And then when I've got you to that point where you actually see the value and you want it, that's where the sales made. But everybody has to do the same thing because no matter whether you're in a sales role, 
you always have to be selling your thinking. Well, in our experience, we have a we have a profiling tool in effective intelligence where we profile people's thinking. I have yet to find two people in the same organization with the same thinking profile. So what that means is we look at the same thing, but we process it very differently. And so understanding that there are different types of thinking and that you have to, and that people are not going to necessarily approach things the same way, you have to have a process. You have to have a process and you have to figure out how do I get people to actually want what they need. And, and so it becomes, that becomes the critical part of it. And in managerial leadership, you've also got to be able to sell. Now, there are going to be some times where what actually has to happen is not what I want and not what I need. You know, for example, when there's changes occurring inside the organization and the likes, but by and large, it's about getting to that point where people actually desire it. And that's that leader. That's really the key leadership piece is getting people to desire it and to be inspired by it. So. And, and when you look at to, to drive this point, I love this conversation, by the way, uh, to drive it home even further in sales, you you they, in order for somebody to buy something, they have to first imagine them doing it first. So you have to paint a picture through conversation, through questions, however it's done. They have to first imagine it in their mind before they ever make a decision. So in essence, what you're doing is you're having them decide twice. You're having them decide in their mind and then you're having them verbally decide. This is the same thing for leadership. You have to paint a vision of where you're taking your organization and the people in your organization have to visualize it themselves and see how they fit into that vision. And the vision has to be big enough that all of them fit within it and they have their own piece of it. So then it's, 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 they imagine it and then they, they decide it in their mind and then they act and they do the same decision. It's interesting you say that because, you know, one of the issues in North American society is this visualization type of thinking, true imagination, mm -hmm. where you create a vision, is one of the least used thinking styles for people. And so you got to get good at that. And that's actually how you inspire. You breathe life into people by painting that picture. Mm -hmm. That's the word, that's what the root word of inspire. It's the same as, as breathing, as inspiration. It's the same construct that you're breathing life into them by painting mm -hmm. that picture. And unfortunately, we tend to either be realists or we get all wound up in our passions and, our, and we just sort of charge forward as opposed to really spending the time and creating that image and to pull people forward. Yes. Now, this is this is great. This is great. So I want to ask you some questions because sure. I haven't had a brigadier general on my podcast. <laughs> so I'm super excited. I want to I want to do some rapid fire kind of leadership lesson questions. Uh -oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I set myself up for this one. You're like, oh man, let's go, let's go. So, um, first off, um, imagine that you're talking to a group of I don't know what the rank structure. I, I assume that you guys have lieutenants. Oh yeah. Okay. We call them lieutenants, but lieutenants. So imagine you're talking to a group of lieutenants. All right, and you're trying to you want to impart upon them, like you know. It, does, it can be any random number, five, seven, eight leadership strategies that will help them at their level to be the most effective that's going to set them on the path to success to get to where you are. What would those, how many would be, it doesn't matter, but what would those strategies be? Well, I think, you know, there's, I, and I, I've sort of, I've sort of morphed my two careers, you know, my army career and my, my, uh, my civilian career, if we want to call it that. And, and I see that there are three things that, that a leader, a managerial leader, adds value to their people right away with. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll explain I'll explain them. So the first one is, is that only the boss, only the managerial leader is in a position to set context. We don't set context very well. In, in business, and we don't also, the, the, the militaries, the, you know, the NATO forces are pretty good on setting context, but business, it's horrendous at it. And that is explaining why something's happening, explaining the big picture. But only the boss can set that, that context. The next is defining what is the end state of the work, where I need you to get to. Only the boss can do that. And the third one is getting them the resources. 
Now, the reason that it, this kind of fits for lieutenants or lieutenants is, is that they're generally junior, they're junior officers. They're just starting off in their career and they go, oh my God, I don't have all the skills and knowledge. These guys are so much older. They've got all this experience, but it's about understanding that the role that you perform, if you use these three things, setting context, defining the work and getting the resources for your people, you are immediately adding value. You don't have to know how to do all the various things that everybody else has to do because that's their job. Mm. Your job is to do those three things and really understanding that because far too often people back off and say, well, I don't have the experience and I'm, and, and, and they shy away. It's back of that perfectionism, if you want to call it that. And so it's about if you recognize that those are the three things that you have to do, you immediately add value and you're fulfilling your role. So that's that's how I would approach it. That so, you, and this is the second time that you've kind of mentioned the perfectionism mentality of of backing off before just kind of jumping in and acting. Um, and I feel like this is something that has been perpetuated even more in the past two decades ish. What do you think is the do you do you see the same trend since you were in your beginning military career to now in terms of that? And what do you think the reason is for that? That's a really great question. Um, I it, it, absolutely it's it's getting worse and worse. Uh, uh, I think, and, and part of that is, I, I think part of it is is that we're data junkies and we've got information around us all the time, so we've got lots of things to compare against. Mm -hmm. And and what ends up happening is, is that if you have this perfectionist tendency, then you start to see yourself as an imposter and you don't bring your real self forward. And as a result, then you refrain and, and the real you is not coming out. Um, and, and so so I think that that's I think that that's really uh, that's that's the issue now why it's happening i think it probably is because we're inundated with data uh i made a i made a you know sort of a a, a swat at social media there but you know i, I, I put my perfect world on social media so that everybody can't see that my perfect world isn't really all that perfect right we're mm -hmm. we're, we're we're pretending we're we're creating this facade for people rather than being the real self. And I see the facade time and time again in business is, is that I think I'm supposed to be somebody that I'm not. So I'll create this facade and, and I will, and, and it'll be, it won't be the real me, but then everybody can smell you a mile away when you've got a facade up and they go, something's not right here. And that leads to trust issues and a variety of things. So the trick is to be as authentic as you can now there's a tension there, you know. If if my authenticity is is that I am a sociopath, that's a dangerous thing, right? So, but but it's it's about being as authentic as you can be instead mm -hmm. of instead of trying to be somebody that you're not. And you know the books on my bookshelf behind me are full of you know military history and things like that, and. So leaders often have to put on a mask of command because they're fulfilling a role. But understand that it's that balance between being authentic and fulfilling the role that's critical. Mm -hmm. And so there's a tension there. And as tension, tension seeks resolution, you're either fully authentic or you're not, or you're fulfilling the role kind of thing. And but you, there's got to be a happy medium somewhere in between. I don't know whether that was whether that was particularly helpful, but no, I, this is more of just a thought question. Um, I'm I'm fascinated by it because um, I feel like it's something that is almost plaguing all of society, um, and and you see it not only in business and in leadership, but you see it just in everyday life. Um, and the the um, American Medical Association has estimated that uh, anxiety. And depression are the number one mental disorders that are treated. 45% of all Americans are treated with anxiety and depression. And it's higher than it's ever been. And it started to spike when with the invention of the smartphone and social media. Interesting. And yeah. uh, 
It's just, it's just, it's, it's crazy how those, those things, because people are so addicted, the dopamine hits that happen yeah. whenever you're, you know, at your social media, you put a post and someone likes it. So what do you do? You do another post waiting for those likes. Then you get depressed and no one likes it. Then you see a notification, a like, and it sucks you back in. And then you're like, well, I got to keep getting likes. And so you keep you, and it perpetuates you having to portray a specific life online in order to get those likes. So you can get those dopamine hits. And it's, that's like that fake dopamine. Like you went to a casino or you ate really bad food that this guy, that that small burst instead of doing something that actually helps you like working hard on something going exercising getting up early being disciplined etc and people are replacing it with the with the i would say like negative dopamine almost and um but it's having an effect on a, 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 a secondary and tertiary effects on businesses on entrepreneurship on leadership because of it's just it's it's like a pandemic almost for it that I've seen. So it's like, how do we fix that? How does that how does that change? And is is that the, is that even really the cause? I don't know, but but I'm fascinated by it. <laughs> well, but it's interesting, you know. And I know this is one of your values: be disciplined. Mm -hmm. But we live in an age of lack of discipline. Yes, like it, it is. It is gone by the wayside. So self discipline is not there, and at the same time we have removed any forms of discipline external to us. So we downplay the role of the manager. We downplay the role of the, the vice principal in the high school that, that hauls you in and deals with these things. And certainly as parents, you know, we're seeing a society now I'm, I'm liable to get whacked for this, but anyway, you know, I got four kids and, I, and, 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 and they don't get spanked or anything like that. So I'm not talking about discipline in that sense, but it is about there needs we need some framework of discipline around us yes to help us get through the day to just this, help us this and, is what actually you, creates freedom in your schedule creates freedom in your life well and and you know Ed, we talk about this notion of accountability versus responsibility mm -hmm. now if you look up in the dictionary you look up accountability it says see responsibility that doesn't help but when you look up responsibility it says see accountability that doesn't help but what we define accountability as is being held to account by someone, accountability, as opposed to responsibility is my response. So responsibility comes from a personal feeling of obligation and accountability comes externally to me. Mm -hmm. And we lack accountability in the world right now. We lack accountability. People are not being held to account. And held to account doesn't mean, mean that it's necessarily, you know, it's always negative. There's positive accountability as well, providing good consequences to people. The, pack on the, the pat on the back, you know, these sort of things are, are important. And, you know, as I described, you think of it as a spectrum of, you know, on one hand in business, it's you're going to be fired. That's the negative end of the spectrum. On the other, it's you're going to get a bonus, but it's a spectrum and managerial leaders. And we all need to be able to utilize the full spectrum. And if I spend all my time on the negative side, if I'm a perfectionist, so I'm bringing back to the perfection discussion. If I'm a perfectionist, then it just, it becomes, it becomes deafening. It's just always the negative, always the negative. Whereas if you spend more time on the positive side, catch them doing something right to, to quote Ken Blanchard, the uh, uh, you know the the uh, the, the uh, leadership guru, catch them doing something right. Spend your time on the positive side. When you go over to the negative, it has an impact. But if you're just always finding the negative, and as a parent, you know I know which side I'm always on. Uh -huh. But but in reality, it's about you've got to be on the positive side and building people up. But accountability is critical. Holding people to account. And you give them the commensurate authority. If you're going to be held to account, give them the authority. Don't create massive checks and balances and control measures. Actually have the conversations with them if they step over the guidelines, if they step outside. But organizations don't do that. And society as a whole doesn't hold people accountable. We have a hard enough time holding politicians accountable. The current situation in Ukraine is is a lack of accountability we didn't hold them accountable the first time so they figured they could get away with it the second time 
So it's it's throughout our society. So it's it's this lack of accountability that is that is problematic as well. Whether that's the cause, um, I don't know, but uh, but it's certainly part of the part of the the problem. There's there's I mean there's there's multiple levels here because you have you have the people that are crying wolf that are just pointing the finger at everything and just being like they did this they like. They're not calling me this, that, the other. They're, they won't identify my made up gender or whatever. <laughs> like they're, they, you have that, right? That they're trying to hold people accountable for something that should not be there. And so what that causes is this like this uh, apathy to, to exist now. Um, and then you also have where people should be held accountable, but they're not. And then you have a complete lack of self accountability. Right where people aren't looking at themselves as a third party, as a almost like a third party person, which I find as an entrepreneur, successful entrepreneurs can do this well, because they can almost like split up themselves in their mind to be like, hey, I'm the boss, but I'm also the worker. So I have to also lead myself effectively so that I can get the job done, especially solopreneurs, because if not, the job's not gonna get done, I'm not gonna get paid, I'm gonna go broke, I'm back to a 95, listen to someone else tell me what to do. And so you can almost effectively like almost split that in your mind and be like, I got to be the, I got to wear both hats. And it's really easy. It's much easier for, I think people like that to hold themselves accountable because they can look at almost like a third person, but for them. And I think that's why they have that success. It's, it's interesting. And, and I, I come back to Now we wouldn't say necessarily holding myself accountable. We would say responsibility. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. But, but, but bear with me here, Greg, for a sec, because I think, and, and and it actually just came to me as a as a way to describe this. So in the notion of in the notion of the the environment that we live in, we are making choices. We are choosing how we're going to respond. Mm. And so good responsibility is 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 responding to the environment and realizing that I'm responding to the environment. So in in a there's a, a notion called choice theory, which mm -hmm. is I'm making choices. I'm choosing. I'm not a victim of my circumstance. I'm choosing how I respond to my circumstance. And that's really responsibility is, is that how do I respond to my circumstance? And, 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 and so, you know, the, and, and you see this, you see this with, uh, you know, individuals that are extremely successful. It's because they have overcome their environment. They have chosen how they're going to respond to their environment rather than falling back and being a victim to their environment mm. and, and feeling like there's a, they're a victim. And this is absolutely critical in, 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 you know, in psychology of being, being able to, to respond to your environment in such a way that you are gaining control of it rather than it controlling you. Because that's really what we all need as human beings is we need a sense of control. This is, so I just got done. I don't know if you've read the book. I just got done reading uh, Outwitting the Devil. By no, I don't know. Napoleon Hill. Oh, okay. You need to get it. I'm telling you, it's the most, it's one of the most life-changing books I've read in a long time. It is unbelievable. Uh, the audio book's even better because he actually has the whole book is him having a conversation with the devil in his mind. Right. And he's, and he's basically put the devil on trial and he's asking him questions about how he, how he's able to tempt and control uh, uh, different individuals on, 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 on the earth and, and the tools that he uses and how it, it I'm telling you, it's powerful. Like when you, especially understanding this was written in 1938 and right. those are at least till 2011. So it's like when you look at it, it's so applicable to today. It's it's almost scary. It's it's wow. very cool. so um so, anyways, he calls he he literally he literally in the book, what you're talking about, he defines that specific person. He, they call them drifters. Mm. People that just kind of like drift through life or they they have no purpose, no aim. And when you don't have that purpose, you don't have that definite purpose, you can't think for yourself, then then an idle mind is the devil's playground. Like the devil's going to think for you and it's going right. to cause you to drift. It's going to cause you to be that victim mentality. It's going to cause all these things, cause you to feed into 
vices, negative, negative thoughts, negative behaviors, et cetera, that just kind of spiral until what they say in the book is a hypnotic rhythm where over time, the more you do it, it almost become, it becomes habit. And once it becomes so much of a habit, it's, it's almost impossible to break. And so it's like, how do you break it before then so that you can get people to start thinking for themselves? Right. But it's just a fascinating concept to me when, especially the, what you, as you were saying, I was like, this is a, identical to how it's described right. in the book. So it, it's interesting, you know, it, if I, just to pull it up from the individual for a moment to the corporation. Yeah. Um, this is the same rule that's performed by defining strategy, by defining what we want to be when we grow up. Now, I use that term very distinctly, that strategy is defining what do we want to be when we grow up. So that's my mission, my purpose, my vision, all of those things. And we find organizations don't do that. In fact, they drift rather aimlessly or they've lost track of that. And I think people have the same problem. They've lost a sense of vision, of purpose, of mission, and they and and they don't explore their, their lives from that standpoint. I mean, presumably, unless you believe in reincarnation, you've only got one kick at this. So you best make the best use of it. Yes. Rather than rather than sitting back. And and it's so critical to have that that drive. And it might not be a fully formed picture, but just think of it from that standpoint of where do I really want to go? What do I want to be? There's the, the old line from Millie Tomlin, right? I always, uh, when I was a kid, I always said I wanted to be someone. When I grew up, I only wish I'd been more specific, was her line, right? So it's about that specificity. Of what do you want to be? What do you want this, this life to be about? Instead of, instead of sort of getting buffeted by the storms of the world, really choose a path for yourself and, and drive forward from there. You, and, you, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I was just going to say, you know, so uh, I'll have to get you a copy of my book, The Managerial Leadership Journey, because it is a journey. I'd love that. It's about a journey. Um, and I use the analogy, uh, you know, it's in the introduction to the book. I use the analogy of, of Homer and the Odyssey. Mm -hmm. And that you've got a purpose. Homer, you know, sorry, not Homer. Odysseus has a purpose. He has to get home. And all of these things combine to stop him from getting home, but he drives on and he's got that purpose. And that's the story of all our lives mm -hmm. and that we are on this journey. And that, and it's a, it's sort of a never ending journey. And I, the, I say the same things for managerial leaders that you're on a journey. It's not that you, it's a one and done thing. It's a continual improvement and it's a continual journey. And that we ha need help on the journey and our bosses help us on that journey. And if you if you think about how, uh, I love how you brought up Homer, think about Odysseus's journey. As he goes on his journey, the challenges get more and more difficult. They get more and more harrowing. They get more and more, the, the, the stakes raise. And so if you look at the hero's journey in any story, in any movie, in any video game, in anything, the ones that really pull to us are the ones where we can identify ourselves within. And there's, there's a pull there because it does, we can relate it to our life. We can relate it to all these things, but there's, I think there's like that hero inside all of us where we want to be able to, to get through these challenges and get through the journey and achieve what we want to achieve. But then afterwards life sets in. Right. right. And, then, and then you, and then, you know, you have that challenge. You're like, well, I can't do it. And people just quit too, too soon. There's a book that's like three, I think it's called three feet from gold. And it's, it's literally the concept of people quitting way too soon in right. life and in business and entrepreneurship that through those failures, there are seeds of, of success. And because whether it's a failure, there's something that you can take away that might sh shift your perspective to go another route or to gain experience in order to get better in order to take on future challenges that are going to come, that are going to be more difficult. For instance, when I started in insurance, hell, when I started in, as a, as a, as a uh, uh, army officer, I thought I was going to be in the army for for 20 years. I thought I was going to be in forever. They used to call me, they used to call me the general because I'm tall, I'm six, seven, I'm a big <laughs> dude. So when I was a lieutenant, 
they used to call me the general because I would always everywhere I walked, people saw me. And and so and it kind of be just to be honest, kind of fed my ego. But I was and I got I got really high rankings. All of my OERs were top locks. And then everything changed once I got a divorce. Everything changed. And now mm-hmm. my kids, I, I've got four kids also. Now my kids and I are separated through through uh th- from distance because she's in another state married to another service member and he's always moving so we're in different states i only get him on breaks holidays weekends uh-huh. or not weekends uh, uh, long weekends uh, uh summers but now my whole perspective's changed and so i'm like you know what do i want to potentially deploy or do this or that and and now i'm becoming an entrepreneur i go into sales and every step of the way it wasn't the definitive like this is this is my purpose and passion. It was like, this is a general pathway with left and right limits that as I go along, it gets clear. The vision gets clearer and clearer, clearer all the way. till I didn't know when I started, I was going to do a podcast. I, didn't, like, I had no idea. You know, I had no idea when I started, I was going to be able to create my own IMO or do coaching and consulting and all this. I had no idea. It just kind of came as I went along the path. And, and, and so for those of you that are listening, if you're like, well, I don't know my purpose of passion is you just, you, you have to start something, right? Like you, you can start anything, anything that you have a desire to be like, you know, I'd always like to do that. Just start doing it. That like, that's perfect. That means you have the power within you to get good at it, to go do it. And you should start executing on it now, because as you do it, you will get better. You will learn skills. You will, you will grow in your potential, your potential will continue to get pushed every single time you push yourself. And as you do that, you're opening your mind up to more opportunities. You're learning more things. You're starting to, you, before you know it, you're meeting people doing the same things because you start posting about it or you go to events or whatever. And now these new opportunities open up things that you never even thought of that you wouldn't have done if you not start moving when you started. You know, there's, there's a couple of things. I mean, that that's that's quite a story, Greg. And, and there's a couple of things that sort of come to mind. And it goes all the way back to when we were talking about selling, getting people to want what they need. What we have to do as human beings is we have to figure out what we want and what we need. Now, my kids were great at telling me they needed this and they needed that. Those were really wants, right? Yeah. Well, what do you actually truly need? And we find when when people really start thinking about this, that need list is narrowed, is narrowed tremendously. And it comes down to what do you want? And it's, so it's not about being able to say, I want to be, you know, I want to be X, Y, and Z or Z. It's about what do I need and what do I want? And then the options will come to you when you can identify those things, when you can identify this. And I find this uh, particularly if individuals, so I'm working with individuals who have suddenly found that their career has suddenly changed, right? So they've been let go or, you know, they've decided to leave a company or whatever the case may be. They have to go back and figure out what do I want and what do I need? And it's really about having that clarity, but then the courage to go after it. Mm. And, and so, and this need and want is a critical criteria for decision-making, but the other piece in decision-making is the risk assessment. Because far too often we're worried about risk and perfectionism fits into that risk space, right? Because if I'm a perfectionist, well, I've got to get this right, then I'm not necessarily going to take it. So a a phrase that I I love is, is that unexamined risk becomes fear. So the trick is, is for us to actually think through the risk. So what's the worst thing that can happen if I do this? What's the probability of that happening? And what's the severity? And you find that suddenly those risks aren't so fearsome because you've actually thought it through. Otherwise, I mean, you would watch the media these days and they know all the risks out there would make you not even want to step out of the house. But you got to ask yourself, you know, what's what's the worst thing that could happen? What's the probability and severity? And that becomes so critical in our lives is to recognize that we're being ruled by this risk thing, this risk creature that's creating fear in us. Mm-hmm. So it's um, it, it's it's very powerful stuff. And it's all about how we can think through these things. These are the things that, that we can deal with. Which which is the steps. That's the critical step in the book that uh, uh, in um, outwitting the devil of be going from a drifter 
to a non-drifter was starting to critically think, starting to think for yourself. That was yeah. like one of the main steps. And I like to take it a step further for the risk for the for a risk assessment is, hey, what's the worst thing to happen? And then I try to imagine, okay, let's say it happens. Then what? Right. Then what? And I and I keep walking it down. And it's just like when you walk it down, it's like, let's say the worst did happen. What are you gonna do? And then what are you gonna do? And then what are you gonna do? And then what do you and then all the way at the end, it's just like, well, then everything's gonna be fine. I'm just gonna end up trying something else. Okay, so let's just go ahead and right. do this. <laughs> like, are you gonna die? No, okay, let's go. <laughs> so, and that's what I usually do with my coaching clients, you know, when it when they're having like anxiety about certain things. Okay, well, let's talk this out. What's the worst thing that happened? <laughs> and just have them think through it. And when they start to critically think, you can see like a shift in, in their mindset. Well, it's that critical part of the military uh, estimate process, right? The so yeah. what of the factors. Mm -hmm. So what? So what are you going to do about it? So what? So what? And driving down. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, uh, absolutely. it's absolutely critical for sure. And it, so, Go ahead. No, 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 go. I was going to ask you. So, uh, what are some of your favorite leadership books? Top, top three leadership books. Top three leadership books. Well, the top one, bar none, and you'll appreciate this, is "Defeat into Victory" by Viscount Slim. Okay. Yep. Yeah. The story like of the Fourteenth Army in Burma, because yeah. it's, and I've used this with clients, with with non-military clients, to to look at how do I rebuild the morale of my organization. How do I understand what are the things that have to come into place uh, in order to get there? So that's um, that, that's um, by far and away the the, uh, uh, the most important one to me. Um, uh, and then where do you go from from there? There's far too many books. I'd have to I'd have to look over my shoulder. Um, I love a book that uh, that came out just uh, just a while ago. Well, a while ago, just before the tech crash. Uh, and it's called Simplicity. It's How Do You Simplify Your World by Bill Jensen. Okay. And um, and he's got to because and the reason why I think it's it's a powerful book right now is I talk to clients and they're in too many meetings. They have too many emails. Their world is not simplified. And so it's about how do you simplify your world? And he's got a, I think it's the field guide to simplicity, which is another, uh, which is a variation on the book, which gives you all sorts of examples of how to simplify your world. Yeah. You know, do I need to do, why am I CCing that person? Do they really need to do anything if I CC it to them? Or am I really just covering my ass, right? So yeah. it's these sort of, these sort of things. Uh, so that's a, that's a pragmatic tool set. Um, and, uh, oh gosh, I'd have to look over my shoulder again. Good grief. There's, um, I'm not sure, Greg, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what I would say the third let's, one is. Let's, let's stick with two. Cause I got one more question that I ask all my guests. Okay. So this one, this one, this one will be three. Also, you have the opportunity to sit with, break bread with, have a conversation with, learn from three individuals anyone in history, alive or deceased, who are those three and why? So um, one, I, one I would say is the Dalai Lama. That's a good one. Okay. Okay. And I think that's about, um, that's about calm and that's about understanding the nature of, of who we are as human beings and the, and the human predicament. So that would definitely be one. Um I, uh, I'm a bit of an amateur military historian. I'm a great fan of Wellington. So I would definitely sit down and find it, you know, because I mean, he, he had a tremendous career and, you know, ultimately culminated with defeating Napoleon at Waterloo and, uh, but very self-effacing uh, from that standpoint. Um, and the third, the third, um, Again, I can only do two, so I'm going to only give you two. <laughs> two that, that came that's, to mind. That's fair because um, I usually don't do the book question. I was just fascinated with all your books, and I figured you had some good ones, which you did. You did yeah. have some good ones. So I, actually, I like simplicity. I'm going to go get it and and read that because I know somebody that could use that in my organization. Well, and and, and as I said, I think so. Actually, it is on the bookshelf. The Simplicity Survival Handbook, I think, is better because it, it gets right to how do you do this stuff. 
Yeah. Okay. I mean, the argument, uh, like we know now that we need to make life a lot simpler. So you don't have to make up that argument, but the, 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 uh, the handbook gives you the tools to do it. Okay. And, and I suppose I could be truly arrogant and full of hubris and say, the third book is my book. You should. So you yeah. So there you go. Where can they get it? Where can they get your book? Uh, it's available on Amazon, amazon.com. Uh, yeah. It's available at Barnes and Noble, uh, all online. Uh, so it's both a Kindle version and a hard copy version. And it's the managerial leadership journey, an unconventional business pursuit. You'll appreciate this, Greg. There's a double entendre to that. It's because of the military and the civilian coming together. Because, you know, traditionally it's business books are by business guys or, or and I use guys in a non-gender specific sense, but, but it's, you know, it's, it, it, this is, a, and, and particularly where I come from, uh, having a military background is not, uh, is not that, uh, not that well known and, and it's not part of, it's not de rigueur as they say, so. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So it's available on, uh, on at Amazon, and we have a website. If anyone's got any questions, feel free to reach out. But uh, well, yeah, what's uh, the best place they can connect you? What's your website? And this will also be in the show notes. Well, there's there is the there is actually we've got a website for the book managerialleadershipjourney.com or Forest and Co. Forest is in the trees, but with two R's. A N D C O dot com. But awesome. you just Google Julian Chapman and you'll find me. It's relatively easy, I think, these days. I think there's a dentist and an act and a photographer. So I'm neither of those. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Julian, thank you so much for coming on and having a conversation about leadership on the Be the Difference podcast. This has been uh, an amazing episode. I love talking about leadership and it doesn't happen very often. I feel like I've been talking about a lot of marketing and sales lately. So uh, it's always a nice refresher to, to have a, a, a thoughtful leadership conversation with somebody, especially someone that, like you that has a lot of experience and, and uh, um, can share a lot of wisdom. So, Well, thank you very much, Greg. It was great to be on the show and you asked some great questions. You stumped me a couple of times there, which is good. And never did I think I was going to get into talking about the Odyssey today. So there you go. There we go. I like it. You never like know what the world's going to throw at you. I like jumping into all kinds of things, you know, to see where we go. For those of you listening, if you got any value, obviously you got some value for listening until now. Do me a favor and do Julian a favor. Uh, all we ask is that you share this content with other people that can also get value from it because we grow organically just by word of mouth. So that means that you share this content, maybe potentially it might also impact them teach them something, help them with their leadership skills, or they can get some good books to read that can help them within their business or their life. That takes you 30 to 60 seconds to rate, review, subscribe, to share, but it means the world to both Julian and I. This has been the Be The Difference Podcast. I'm your host, Greg Birch. Until next time, we'll see you.